for tuning in to Now You See TV. This is your host, John Pounders. Please be sure to share, like, subscribe, and comment on this video so that others can hear and understand the truth in this broadcast. Today we have our friend Gary Wayne, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. I'm about three quarters of the way through this book and let me tell you that this book hands down has the most information regarding secret societies, bloodlines, and their hidden knowledge than any other book I have ever read. Tonight we'll be talking about a portion of Gary's book that has to do with the Holy Enoch and the Evil Enoch from the line of Cain. Enochian magic, secret societies, pyramids, giants, fallen angels, and all occult learning stem from one of these Enochs. Gary, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, John. I've been uh, very much looking forward to getting together with you, and I'm hoping it's going to be a very interesting night. Yeah, let me start by saying that your book has so many things with ample references, and most of these things I was completely unaware of, and I've read a lot of books. Uh, not only is your book full of information, but it's a great reference for any scholar that would be wanting to study this information, because I'm pretty sure out of all the books that I have combined, your book has more references and more uh, information in it than all those books combined. And I have quite a few of the books on this subject. And uh, but basically, in this show, we're going to discuss um, we're going to discuss one one or two chapters. I believe it's two chapters. One is uh, the Enoch and Hermes, and then the other one is the Evil Enoch. And um, we, I mean, we could really do a show about each chapter in your book because your book is, is so full of information. I mean, I, anybody that's listened, I really, 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 really recommend this book. I'm about three quarters of the way through and I've had to read each chapter very slowly so that I can filter all this information that's coming through because, um, most of the stuff I've been wondering about almost my whole life, wondering where a lot of this stuff comes from, uh, wondering about the pyramids, wondering about where, who Hermes was, Wonder about where Enochian magic came from, and um, this this pretty much this chapter right here fills a lot of that in. So if you would, let's go ahead and get started, man. I'm I'm really excited too. One thing about we're going to be meeting in Nashville coming up next month and doing a video interview, man, and that's that's amazing. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to it too, as well, uh, John. And I want to thank you for the nice comments you made about the book, and just want to underline that. There is a lot of information in the book, and there's over 100 pages of endnotes to support what I'm writing so that everybody can track it back. And that was one of the goals that I wanted to do when I wrote the book, is I wanted to bring credibility to this whole genre and bring new information that other people haven't thought about and connect dots that other people haven't connected before. And when we talk about the subject of Enoch, this is one of those unconnected dots in terms of who Enoch was and the far-reaching impacts that uh, Enochian literature has. And so it's very, very important to understand who Enoch was. And we're going to talk about two Enochs tonight um, just to get people prepared. But this is key to the whole Nephilim narrative, in my opinion. I totally agree, man. It's a key to all the hidden knowledge, in my opinion, as well. I mean, um, I mean, this is where most of it stems from, am I right? That's absolutely correct. Uh, Enoch is, is the root to all of these different references, whether people call it the Golden Fleece or the Pearls of Wisdom or the Archives of the Masons or the Golden Apples or the, the Grail Quest or... Uh, the information of the Ark of the Covenant, they're all allegories that go back to what happened before the flood and with Enoch. All right, man. Well, let's dig in. Go ahead and start us off um, at the beginning of this whole Enoch thing and uh, give us, I guess, a background on the both, of both of the Enochs. Well, I think one of the first things that I always find interesting is, is people often overlook that there were two Enochs. And so if we're going to look at Enochian literature and the impact that Enoch had on prehistory and beyond the flood and even to our time, we need to understand that there, there were two Enochs because one has to realize that there were two different scriptures and two different references to what was going on. And we, we have to keep straight who the two Enochs were. So let's just talk about Enoch that 
most people are familiar with. And he was seventh from the lineage of Adam in down through the lineage of Seth. And so he was born after Jared, and Jared was the sixth generation uh, when the Nephilim came in into uh, being. It was that generation, and that time frame is very important. Then came Enoch, then came Methuselah, Lamech, and then Noah. Conversely, on the Cain branch, Cain, son of Adam, bore his first son, and his name was Enoch. And so he's born earlier than Enoch and was around much before Enoch was. And Enoch received all the information and the knowledge that Cain would have received from Adam. And when we look at what happened in Eden according to Gnostic recollections and or Freemasonry recollections and masonry, pre antediluvian masonry as they like to call it, they have many, many legends about this, and Adam received education, information, knowledge from heaven, and he passed it on to his two sons. Um, not Cain, or not Abel, because Abel obviously was slain by Cain, but on to Seth and on to Cain. So both had this source of information that apparently came out of Eden. Now, biblically, we're not told that, but we are told that, you know, Adam spent a lot of time in, in Eden, and it certainly is possible that he received great knowledge from God while in, in heaven, and that he was a practitioner of the information that he would have received. Or it's possible that Cain received this information from the dark angels. Certainly, biblically, that's not clear. But what is clear from the other testimonies and particularly from the Gnostic religions and from the uh, Masonic organizations and secret societies is Cain received what they call the seven sacred sciences, as did Seth. Now, Seth practiced mostly astronomy because his, his descendants were agrarians. And Cain and the people that he likely married into were mostly nomads and hunters and gatherers until Cain came along and, and reorganized them. But they used these sciences that they got in heaven, and they were called the seven sacred sciences, and they included things like music and arithmetic and uh, geometry and uh, all the different sciences, astronomy. So there was seven in total. There was rhetoric involved. There was the ability to write. And I list all of those seven sciences. And even though they sound mundane, and they were revolutionary at that time for civilizing humankind, and it's the level of knowledge that they took this knowledge to. And so Cain indoctrinated Enoch in all of this knowledge. And at this time, additional information was provided to the descendants of Cain and Enoch in particular, additional illicit knowledge that came from heaven from the dark angels. And so we have two different levels of information coming to Enoch. Now what Enoch does is he starts to develop how to organize this information and how to utilize them and how to pervert them. And from there, he organizes it into secret societies with initiation, and he also formulates a, a religion, a religion that honors the fallen angels and no longer honors God. And they start to prefer all of this knowledge in ways that probably were not uh, what God wanted them to do, but we can see such knowledge being uh, manifested towards the end of the uh, the generations before the flood because they great built all of these great monuments, things like the pyramids. And when we look at mythologies from around the world, we see a civilization, and let's say several civilizations from their perspective because they looked at more than just the Sumerian civilization, but civilizations that were all over the world. And there was either three or four, depending on which one you look at as major civilizations or empires, and they developed civilizations that had significant technology, significant information, significant advancements in the ability to build, and they did it all 
to honor the great architect of the universe, as they like to call him, which, of course, was Lucifer. Yeah, so basically, um, you know, I, I this is this is on the subject. I have a, had a friend that uh, had uh, given me a book, or he he tried to give me a book. I told him I didn't want to read it, but the book was about Hermes. Um, tell us how Enoch and Hermes are basically the same, one and the same. Yeah, so Enoch uh, from the King line. Um, became very, very famous uh, for uh, the development of all knowledge, including um, inventing writing, which uh, probably were hieroglyphs, as the, the Masons like to call it, and that the writings that Enoch invented, and other people believe it was the cuneiform. And he, he did this to uh, be able to record all this information so, so that it wouldn't be lost. And so he became fused with a number of people through history and prehistory because of this knowledge. And in some accounts, they have Enoch actually uh, evolving into a god uh, because of the knowledge. And he was the intermediary between the gods or the fallen angels and, and the kings. And so over time, uh, Enoch is called different names in, in different civilizations. And so we see Enoch's name come up in all of the ancient civilizations. People just know him differently. And one of those names was Hermes. Another one would be uh, Mercury. Thout was another one. The Quran would refer to um, Enoch uh, as Idris, but when the Quran refers to Idris, they're, they're uh, actually referring to Enoch of the, of the Seth line. And so Enoch preserves all of this information and he stores it in nine volts. And there's some descendants of Enoch that come along the sons of Lamech. And again, there's two Lamechs, one from the Seth line, one from the uh, Cain line. And the sons of, uh, of Lamech, they also have a renaissance of these sciences, but they're preserving this knowledge to cross over the deluge that they know is coming. They can't prevent it, but they don't want to lose their history and they don't want to lose their knowledge and they somehow want to transport this information across the flood. And so the information is stored in nine volts and some people believe those are stored below the, uh, the pyramids. Uh, and they also create two pillars that uh, itemize what the seven sacred sciences are and the location of the, of the hidden or lost knowledge. Right. And so when it crosses the flood, um, there's another character that comes along by the name of Hermes. Um, but before I touch on Hermes, there's a god of wisdom in Egypt uh, that if you look at the mythologies and the religions of ancient Egypt, his name was Thoth, and he has a, a parallel description in terms of uh, what he did, what his role was, and he also became godlike because of the knowledge. And so he's known as Thoth in Egypt as well as Hermes. And I'll get into how that sort of comes together in, uh, in, in a minute or so. But understand that in prehistory that there were seven angels that divided up the earth. And uh, there are the seven angels that were also involved on the creation of the Nephilim. And uh, they essentially set up different cult centers around the world. And so this religion that Enoch had developed and this knowledge went to all of these, these empires, particularly after the Nephilim had taken over and, they, and as kings, and they partnered to, together. And so when we look at uh, prehistory on the legends, Enoch gets merged with Thoth. I actually think Thoth is just another name for one of these seven angels that started these snake societies and brought this religion and knowledge along in, in the different civilizations um, that they that were that had belonged to them. But that's the first merging. And then when you cross the flood, you have Hermes of Egypt and Hermes of Greece who. The Greeks also call their Greek Hermes Mercury so that there is a separation in terms of how they understood 
Hermes as to the Egyptian Hermes. But when we look at where Hermes came from, uh, he's not in the Bible. And so his name is, is very, very difficult to, to track, except that if we get into Masonic legends, we understand that Hermes partnered with Nimrod at Babel. And it was Hermes who found these two pillars that I was talking about before. And so now he becomes, along with Nimrod, the two co-conspirators to have a renaissance of this antediluvian knowledge at Babel, which was manifested in the tower. And we understand the power of this information that they had just gotten their hands on and started to de redevelop in the post diluvian world. When we look at the Babel account and paraphrasing what it says in Genesis about Babel is, is that with one language and working as one people, there's nothing that th they will not be capable of doing. And this goes to this, this knowledge that I was talking about. So Hermes, after Babel, he moves off to Egypt with Mizram and with Ham to start the Egyptian civilization again. And Nimrod stays in Chaldea and, and continues to develop as best he can with the different languages and all the different things that they have to deal with, um, the development of this this knowledge and this religion again, and people will know the Chaldeans as the Babylonians and the wise men who produced the Magi. I think everybody's really familiar with that, but they don't really know exactly how they got that information. Well, it first resurfaced again at Babel. And so Hermes, once he moves over with uh, Ham and, and Mizram to Egypt, they start all of this development of the religion and the mysteries uh, again in Egypt. And that's where Hermes starts to get fused with uh, with Enoch. And then there's a third Hermes that comes along um, quite a bit later, who was the father of alchemy, which is one of the offshoots of the knowledge of these seven sciences. And understand that, because I don't think I underlined it well enough earlier, is, is that the power of this knowledge that was developed and what they were trying to develop, again, had to be housed in secret societies for the elite because they felt that knowledge was so powerful that it could destroy the world. And they certainly didn't want this information in the hands of the mundane mortals or the descendants of Noah or the descendants of Seth. So they wanted to keep it separated from them along with their belief in reincarnation and the process that goes along with that. And so... In the post-Diluvian world, Hermes is so bound to Enoch and the history that they, they sort of come together as one figure. And then with the third one, you get the, the, Trime the three Hermes or the Tremescus Hermes that uh, people might be familiar with in, uh, in the occult world. And so it's just, to me, it's a fusing of these three characters all into one to try and make sense of all of this history and all of this knowledge that was that was uh, uh, originally developed in in prehistory and crossed the flood and and so they came up with that title as sort of the cos cosmology of all of this if that makes sense yeah that makes perfect sense man and uh, you know i as far as the information goes um so you said that they might have knowledge to destroy the entire world um mm -hmm. obviously you know, there's a lot going on right now with CERN and, and uh, organizations such as that. Um, and we all know, anybody that's listening to this that doesn't know, um, we know that there are elite class, there are, um, the, the Bible calls them spiritual powers, thrones, uh, just different kinds of spiritual powers that control our world that we live in. Um, how close do you think, uh, you know, the Antichrist that says he'll understand dark sentences do you believe that has to do with this particular kind of knowledge that maybe uh, a lot of people don't quite understand yet, but are there, with technology they're getting towards the understanding? Yeah, and I think a couple things on that aspect is, is certainly the Antichrist will be absolutely illuminated, and I don't use that term um, lightly because it's a specific term for uh, the adepts and he'll be a super adept and he'll be of genius level and he will be totally familiar with all of this 
information and knowledge. And we'll see more of this knowledge coming out as we get closer to the end times. And I think we'll see significant displays of it in the end time so that it deludes the people into believing that the Antichrist is the is the Messiah and they will lead the rebellion and they will lead humankind uh, to freedom. Um, so that definitely is, is all connected. And if we look at science today, all of our sciences come out of this. And so when we talk about the seven sacred sciences, those are also known as the seven liberal arts. And it's the pillar of our scientific knowledge today. There was an organization that was organized in the uh, 1600s called uh, uh, Freemasonry. And uh, amongst the Freemasons were the Rosicrucians were, who were forming Freemasonry. And at the same time, these people partnered to start a society called the Royal Society. And the Royal Society is also called the Invisible College. And if there's people who are familiar with the Invisible College term, then they'll be a little bit more familiar with the mystic side of what I'm talking about. Because, again, that has a very specific reference in Rosicrucianism as to what the Invisible College is. But this is the... This is the start of modern science, and it was created to de not only develop the sciences, but to pay honor to the great architect of the universe, and who, of course, is Lucifer. And all of these terms are um, connected because it's part of their belief system. What's important about this is, is all of the education and all of the scientific communities pay homage to the Royal Society to this day. So they're inundated with their religion and their belief systems. So one wonders why Christianity and Christian beliefs don't get a hearing and aren't considered in any, anything other, as long as it's not got anything to do with the Bible is considered. This is why. And so this knowledge that they're developing and what we're looking at at the CERN, whatever they're doing there, and there's a lot of speculation there, but they're playing uh, with technology and science that is uh, you know, amazing on the surface level, but very, very dangerous. This is in pursuit of their Luciferian agenda. There is no doubt about it because science is a slave to the Royal College, to these ancient organizations, to the seven sacred sciences, to this whole conspiracy that's been going on since prehistory. And I think what you know people sort of need to realize uh, about this is, is that we can see a lot of the homage still being paid in education today or in different particular sciences so that they have to wear rings and they have to do initiations when they're in college. Uh, and we look at, let's say, the medical society, for example. Just look at any of those symbols that they're using. And, and I'll use the medical societies, whether it's doctors or it's institutions. They use this snake wrapped around a stick motif. And that's their Hermes motif. And you're going to see a dual snake motif and a single snake motif. And some of them will have Hermes sandals on the bottom. Every organization in the medical field will have a variation of it. And I'll even take that back where it goes back to Greek mythology and how that was developed. But both, both of those lead directly back to the snake societies of old and the knowledge that uh, they possessed, and certainly medical knowledge has been always a big part of the sciences and knowledge. Now, one thing, the one thing when I was reading in your book um, on the chapter is called Enoch the Evil. Uh, you were talking about a city in Egypt called Hermopolis, if I'm pronouncing that right, and it's uh, it was the home of the Great White Brotherhood. Yeah. Um, and I know that you discussed that later in your book. Can you kind of explain that just a little bit to us? Sure. People are probably familiar with the great, right, the great White Brotherhood of the Illuminati today. And so this term goes back in time to two locations, um, Hermopolis, and also it was also in Heliopolis, the city of the sun, and it also goes back to Babel. And so Nimrod created the uh, constitution at Babel in the first great White Brotherhood of 
of masonry at the time of Babel. And then it moved to Egypt, to Hermopolis, where it, it thrived in parallel to the Chaldean version. And later on, um, the, uh, the, the constitution and the sciences and the organization was renaissance once more and um, sort of reinvigorated uh, this great white brotherhood society. And what's important about this as well is, is this is the linkage that the uh, uh, a religion and a people that people are familiar with from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes, they are a polytheist sect of Judaism, very much uh, related with Kabbalism. And they believe they received all of their information and their beliefs and their religion and their knowledge uh, back to the Great White Brotherhood. And, of course, the Essenes would wear um, white robes as the people of the Great White Brotherhood did back in, in the day. And if people are looking for uh, a good example of who the Essenes were, these were the people in the temple that Ezekiel referred to who would turn their back to the temple in the mornings and pray in the direction of the rising sun. Because you have to remember that the, the mystical religion that Enoch developed was a sun-worshipping religion. And so the sun uh, is a significant part of this whole worship. And again, you look at sun worship all around the world in all of polytheist colors, uh, cultures, this is not a coincidence. This is just taking it back to the root. Yeah, I exactly, man. And you can see sun worship in in a lot of Christianity. Uh, you know, it's been infiltrated into that. You can see sun worship in so many different uh, religions. I mean, it, it. I mean, any religion has pretty much been infiltrated with it. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask: Do you think that most Masons? Um, think that they're following the teachings of the Holy Enoch? Do they think that they're involved in this holy branch as opposed to the evil branch? I mean, and I'm not talking about the elite that know, that are in the know, in the know uh, not, the, yeah. not the initiated, but uh, the average Mason. Are they going to believe that they're involved in holy teachings? Yes, they, the, the lower level initiatives will be uh, deceived in this manner. And it's done for two reasons. One is uh, so that they that they're not scared, I guess, scared away from the organization. They'll be initiated into Luciferian doctrine at the 33rd degree or the third level of perfection, depending on which organization of masonry you're talking about, because there's two. There's the Scottish Rite, and then there's also the York Rite. So, uh, but at that level of perf perfection, they'll learn who, who the true God is that they worship. Um, but the lower levels will think, and believe that this is Enoch from the Seth line. The second reason that they did it was you have to look at Catholicism and the Roman Church. Uh, they were very, very aggressive against any belief system or religion or organization that ran contrary to the Christian religion. And so they, over time in the last 2,000 years, they meshed these uh, two Enochs together to put on this sort of cloak of being uh, righteous as opposed to who, you know, who the true Enoch is that uh, they recognize. And they recognize Enoch as their true patriarch. And Tubal Cain is, is yet another one of those patriarchs uh, that they look to in a very, very high regard just as they look at Lamech, son of Cain, as a key player and a patriarch, and in particular, uh, a few other of Lamech's uh, progeny. I already mentioned Tubal Cain, but certainly Nama, uh, Jubel, and Jabel. Those are the key ones that uh, they certainly recognize from the seven sacred sciences and developing in prehistory. But Tubal Cain, for the most part, and Enoch and Cain are the most uh, important figures in masonry as far as their prehistory pre records go. Okay, and another thing, you know, you're talking about the two pillars. Um, uh, well, one one person that a lot of um, Freemasons like to refer to is Hiram Biff, um, mm -hmm. and the pillars that they built, I guess, would be Jakin and Boaz. 
Uh, and, and most people say that, you know, I, I've talked to several Masons that say the secret of Freemasonry lie in the pillars of Jacob and Boaz. Is there any significance to those pillars uh, that go along with the, the pillars that we're, you mentioned in this chapter? Yeah, so what, I mean, Solomon is uh, in the other belief system is considered one of the great magis, one of the great wizards, one of the great sorcerers of all time, and uh, also uh, one of the grand superintendents of, uh, of masonry as well. And that's more of a usurping of biblical stories and all of the uh, sort of allegorical things that went along with Solomon's reign. Um, but certainly Hiram Abif um, was a real figure, and he received uh, this building knowledge down through the uh, building organizations, which is, again, another arm of, of uh, the 6,000-year conspiracy of the knowledge of, on uh, how to build these great temples and things. And so his knowledge uh, through the Cretan builders where they um, received their information from um, was utilized in help building uh, the the temple, and all of this is is designed just to uh, delegitimize Christianity and to again give them that sort of um, level of of pedigree and level of authority, um, but really in terms of going right to the pillar of their belief system, it's just another allegory of of uh, several things that are coming together in, in the pillars, but uh, and they're quite prominent in Freemasonry. But I don't, you know, I don't think that it goes to the core of their beliefs. It's just just another allegory, just something to kind of confuse the the uh, members below thirty third degree. Yeah, it's just again, um, and the the illuminated will have a different take on on the meaning of that than what they teach the lower level. Uh, so there's two meanings to all of the allegories that they teach the lower levels. Um, there's the one to those who aren't, aren't ready yet to, to learn the true message, and then that's what, what the true message is. And that's, you have, you have to understand that part of this whole society that was built by Enoch and, and Nimrod and the Great White Brotherhood of Egypt is, is that these organizations have circles within circles. So the Illuminati is at the small little circle of, of Freemasonry, and only those who are illuminated at the 33rd degree level know all of the information and what the true information is. Right. Yeah, it, it, and you know, that's that's one thing that I, if any, anybody's Masons and they are listening to this, they really need to um, take heed to what is being said here and buy this book because um, all of the information that Gary is giving right now is referenced in the teachings that are probably in your library as a Freemason. And um, what you you really need to figure out what you're doing. I know that my uncle was a 32nd degree Freemason. He was a Shriner and, and also Scottish Rite. And um, he was one of the potentates. And, and he was also a Baptist minister. So he did not he didn't know a lot of this stuff at, at his level. At least I don't think he did. He may have, but um, if he did, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it, but this is something that's very important because you're linking yourselves together with a group of people. Um, you know, anybody that you have an oath with, you don't know these people, you don't know who you're linking yourself with. And, uh, I, I believe that Gary's lined it up pretty clear in his book, um, who you're linking yourself with. And, um, another thing, Gary, that I wanted to discuss is the the seven sacred sciences, the different things as far as, you know, obviously astrology and stuff like that. Can you explain a few of these uh, sacred sciences and what they are? Yeah, so let's just go over uh, each of these just quickly. And so the first one is of the seven liberal sciences is, is grammar, and that was to teach humankind to both speak and write. Um, the second one, it was rhetoric, and that was to teach humankind to speak and subtle terms. The third one is dialectic to teach humankind to discern between truth and falsehoods, arithmetic to teach humankind to compute all manners and numbers, uh, geometry to teach humankind uh, to measure the earth and all things and to build things, 
music, which is also is, is uh, numbers based uh, in when you really get down to it. And Pythagoras was a big um, um, proponent of his uh, musical and, and numerology philosophy. Uh, so music uh, was another one, and astronomy was to teach uh, humankind about the planets and the stars, and uh, out of astronomy came uh, uh, astrology, which was a, a noted perversion of prehistory that uh, survived, and also an invention of Enoch. Um, and just so that people understand a little bit more about rhetoric, uh, in its original state, it was the art of persuasion, and grammar was more or less molding and educating men and teaching them to read. So you can see how powerful these things are just from civilizing human, but humans, but how far they could could actually take it. And when you look at some of the mythologies around prehistory at what they were able to do in, in some of the mythologies, you know, flying machines and, and very powerful weapons and uh, incredible monuments that they built, that they really did develop this, these things to, to a great level. So those are the, the original seven sacred sciences. Fantastic, uh, that, man. I appreciate you, you answering that. Now, like when it comes to these sciences, are I know in the book, an actual book of Enoch that was written by the Holy Enoch, it talks about the fallen angels teaching uh, men certain certain things. I guess a lot of these things line up with those seven uh, sacred sciences. It, it does and more, you know, because they brought in things like, you know, abortion and sacrifices and uh, the art of war. And, of course, Tubal-Cain, which is one of the... Uh, uh, famous people from uh, Masonic uh, prehistory. Um, he was uh, very much a military man, and, and uh, some believe he was actually a giant, um, which I suppose is possible, uh, but it would not be through the day six, uh, not through the day six, the Genesis six um, giants, because uh, Tubal Cain was uh, son of Lamech. So unless Lamech married a, a female giant. That probably wouldn't be the case, but legend has it that he was a giant. Yeah, and uh, I know a lot of uh, a lot of people hold to the belief that, um, uh, like, for instance, um, Nimrod, uh, when it says he became a mighty warrior before the Lord, it's actually talking about him um, becoming a giant or of sorts. Um, and I know that you, know, you don't discuss this in your book, but you know, it's very possible. You said that they worked with these fallen angels and with these Nephilim um, to do a lot of these things. So whether or not they were actually giants or, um, you know, things, uh, you know, a fallen angel or whatever, they still were working together with these beings in doing a lot of these things. And the Absolutely. preservation of, of those things were in the were in the pillars. A Absolutely. And... Um... I'm going to just I'm going to come back to that in a second. I want people to understand that uh, Tubal Cain, Nama, Jubel and Jabel, when you look at um, Masonic writings, these these and other mythologies, these people have great, great uh, infamy um, and in uh the legends of the craft from Freemasonry. I mean, Tubal was, he was a, 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 a smith, an artist, artist, artist of the highest level, creating tools and weapons, a master craftsman, a uh, military leader, uh, you know, and from the Bible, it, it just sort of hints at that, um, that uh, Tubal Cain had forged tools from uh, bronze and iron. And also in the book, I'll make a, uh, some surprising references, at least for me, I thought it was surprising that iron actually went back in, in, into prehistory. And I'll uh, spend a little bit of time on that because most people think iron didn't come along till about 1400 BC. At least that's the standard thing that's taught in, uh, in education. Uh, Nama was uh, basically uh, known as uh, creating a craft called weaving, but Nama has more importance than than this she was thought to have uh, married uh, Samael uh, the fallen angel and produced giants uh, through that marriage um, 
Nama is also believed in the Gnostic religion to um, be a derivative of Noria, and Noria has a few different names, probably about five or six different names. And she was married to an interesting fellow named Deculion. And so Deculion and Noria slash Nama were the two that survived the flood in the uh, Greek mythology. And so Deculion was the son of Prometheus. So whether or not Prometheus was a Nephilim or a fallen angel, it doesn't matter uh, because this is still another story of mythology of giants surviving the flood on an ark, which I think is rather interesting. And in, in the Sumerian mythology, uh, Nama is traced back with a, a few different names, um, but understand her as a dragon queen of the original ring lords in, in Sumeria. So she has a very, very infamous legacy that goes out through prehistory, as did Enoch. Uh, Jubal uh, was also noted in uh, the Legends of the Craft as inventing music, and Jubal, um, who is noted for um, living in tents and uh, ranching and farming in the Bible and his account was uh, known for developing masonry. So these were the four that really took the renaissance of the seven sacred sciences to the new level uh, in the generation immediately following the entrance of the Nephilim. And they would have partnered with the Nephilim and it would have become the statewide religion uh, of prehistory and we see that again in so much entertainment and so much mythology that when you see kingships you have uh, these Merlin type wizards or the wizards wizards that you see in um, the Lord of the Rings or if you look at the priests of Egypt and this is that partnership that happened so you had not only the religion in the kings but you had this knowledge and it was all centered and it was all controlled through these secret snake snake societies yeah my ne my next question was going to be um how did the lineage of cain go into the post flood but i think you answered that now you mentioned the lord of the rings and ring lord um i know you you talk about all this stuff in your book that's why people really need to get it but it's so interesting to me that 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 and atlantis and all these things just tie in together to be basically the same thing i mean you you look at these history books and and um it's just it's amazing to me how they all tie together and and people that don't know a lot of people like i've talked to people before that think lord of the rings is a christian based film and that couldn't be farther from the truth <laughs> it is as far from the truth as as you can imagine it does bring to you know reality some information of what that uh, pre-flood world was like, but it is totally from a uh, adversarial perspective, a totally from a polytheist perspective. And you know, the Anunnaki from the, from that time were the were the kings, and so they were the ring lords. They had a all of the kingships were uh, were Nephilim, and they were anointed at Nippur uh, to be kings to to rule the earth and. Uh, that was a ring of kings, a, a circle of uh, a table that they would meet at. And that's, you know, you can see that reflected again in uh, the King Arthur round table. Okay. You know, when you talk, when you see uh, Lord of the Rings and you see uh, the, the two different kinds of little people between the elves and, uh, well, actually, actually, there's three kinds of little people in there. They're talking about perhaps... Um, different beings that were around before the flood uh, because that sort of legacy just ab and mythos just absolutely continues. And, and again, we're not going to talk about aliens in this show, but there's a direct connection to those little people that they keep, that they keep track of in the various fairy tales and, and uh, legends and new literature um, there's one that looks uh, very much like and is likely the, the gray alien. So this is the furthest thing that you can possibly imagine from um, a Christian perspective. Um, but it probably does give us a little bit of a glimpse into prehistory. Okay, so, I mean, we got books like Homer's Iliad, the Theogony, and stuff that mention all these, all these things. And there's a lot of, you know, like the Roman culture and the Greek culture, um, I was reading a book about Nero the other day that said he had an ogre that fought 
uh, in his gladiator stuff. I mean, um, all these things are mentioned in these books that most of the cultures consider history. And, um, you know, so like I, like I said before, if you, if the people that are listening that are Freemasons or that are just normal people would go and, and read their books that, that their, uh, craft believes, uh, they would see this information. Um, what do you, what do you, um, suggest, I guess, to people that are seeking this information, uh, in your, in your book, you have all these references for all these different books. How readily available were these books for you? I know that, I mean, I can't imagine how many hours and upon hours that you spent putting this stuff together. Yeah. So most of the books are, are, uh, quite readily available. Um, it's easy to get, uh, books and, and copies of books, uh, you know, about Greek history and Sumerian uh, history. Uh, but when you get into secret societies like the legends of, of the craft, those can be very, very difficult to get. Getting the Vedas can be very, very difficult, um, especially in English, and you only get pieces at a time. Getting the Popol Vuh was very, very, very difficult. Um, but you just, you know, unless you're really into the umpteenth end of it like I am, all of this other information is very easily uh, um, gotten. Either you can get it from libraries or you can you can order them online. And um, I wanted to stress this uh, again to people that are listening. Um, get this book. I mean, I, I th- we're talking, th- this is two very short chapters in the book that we're discussing in an hour show tonight. Um, I mean, these are, these are probably one of the two of the shortest chapters in your book. And, um, we, we, we just did a four hour show about it. So you really need to get this book. Uh, You know, there's, there's so much more about this. We're talking bloodlines that last come from uh, post flood or pre flood all the way to today. And, um, Gary lines them all out in this book and shows you how they all uh, fit together over time and um you know there we were talking about muslim philosophy that uh you know idris it was one of the people i guess that would be enoch am i right correct yeah correct. so you're, you're talking about you know buddha all these different uh people that kind of all line out together and um you know and they they, they go all the way to bloodlines that are ruling the world right now um to just it's just amazing this book and what we're going to do is we're going to end the show on this note because I know that there's a ton we could talk about. Um, like I said, we only got into two chapters of, of this book and, uh, there's so much more. I mean, we're, you're, you have over near a thousand pages of, uh, knowledge that goes all the way to the end in this book, uh, Gary. And I'm, I'm really impressed with it, man. And I, and I know that, um, a lot of people, we make sure you subscribe and, and do all that stuff on here because I am going to be interviewing Gary in Nashville in October and I'm going to be doing it via video and we're going to be talking about different things about his book and, and just a whole nother subject. And, and, um, so make sure to get the book. It's, uh, I'm telling if you're a scholar, whatever you are, this book has everything that you need to study for these subjects. Yeah. And I'd like to, sort of finish on a couple of things uh, to be careful with Enoch and Enoch literature. And I touched on it a little bit earlier, but the book of Jubilees is uh, a book that the Essenes uh, uh, is their most sacred scripture. And that is uh, Enoch the Evil's book. And so when you're reading anything on Enoch, make sure you continually are reading it um, with a critical analysis, does it line up with what the Bible says? Uh, because if it's not, it's probably a scripture from the other Enoch that, that's been blended in somehow, somehow over time. Um, also understand Enoch, uh, the evil Enoch, as partnering with the potentates of prehistory. He's kind of like the false prophet. And so you have the universal religion that he created at that time, which was in all of those civilizations, and he's the uh, false prophet, and you have the powerful potentates, which is the Nephilim. And so you need to keep that in mind, because again, if you go across the flood and you go to Babel, you have Hermes, who is like the false prophet. You have the Antichrist figure, 
uh, in Nimrod, and you have the whole world working together and, and under a, uh, a mystical religion. This is a similar thing that takes place in the end time. So we need to understand what happened in history uh, so that we can better understand w what is coming. So I encourage people to learn about the different allegories and take it right back to history because um, all of this is, is uh, defined uh, in the Bible uh, as to how it relates to the end time. You just have to take the time to learn about it. Exactly. And, and one, one thing I will ask you is uh, if people are looking to find out, uh, there is a book of Enoch that uh, is mentioned in the book of Jude, and that is, you know, referenced in the scripture that I've read before. And I personally, my, my personal opinion on this and, and, you know, don't, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that my personal opinion is always hundred percent correct, but I believe the book of Enoch is inspired personally as scripture. Uh, what can you give people a, um, a good place to buy the real book of Enoch? Because it gives a lot of information that is left that is not in Genesis that uh, kind of ties everything together. Can you give them a um, idea of what book of Enoch they're looking for? Well, there's uh, there's a few books of Enoch. They don't usually come separate, although I think there might be a few publications out there. They're usually mixed in with Gnostic scriptures or in the Neg Hammadi library. And so there's the, the first book of Enoch and the second book of Enoch, and then there's the Enoch book of Giants. Those are about the only three that I would say that you could probably read and, and not um, look at as a, as a different scripture as to what's in the Bible. And I would also underline that, you know, many, it was, you know, at one time uh, the books of Enoch uh, were part of the original canon, but they were apocryphal even, even at that time. And many of the church fathers used to quote from the books of Enoch. All right, Gary, I appreciate it, man, and I and I, I really appreciate you coming on today because uh, a lot of the questions that I had about Enoch and, and Hermes and all these figures that are are actually Enoch is have been answered today and also answered in your book. I just wanted to make it clear to people because I've, I know so many people personally that are deceived by this information and um, by the information that they've been given because they are, I, I have friends that are Freemasons. I have a uh, family that are Freemasons and I really want them to know. I I've explained, you know, a lot of it to them and I've actually told them to, to check out your book. And, and I, I really want, I really want everybody listening to really just take heed to what is being said here Buy the book. Uh, don't it's, it's one of the only books you're going to need on this subject. I'm telling you. And I don't, I don't promote tons of different books, but I can tell you right now that this book is almost a one-stop shop when it comes to uh, this kind of information because it has everything in it. And uh, so, Gary, I appreciate you being on the show, and I look forward to seeing you next month in Nashville. Terrific. I've really enjoyed uh, the evening. If people want to have a closer look at the book, they can go to www genesis6conspiracy.com. I've got the 98 chapters with some pictures and a little bit about each chapter. And uh, you can also link into uh, barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com to purchase the book in either soft cover or Kindle format. Or if somebody wanted a personalized and or autographed copy, they can order direct from me uh, on the website as well. So um, really want to thank you for this opportunity. Hopefully we've covered some uh, material that uh, people haven't heard before or that they want to pursue a little bit further. All right. Once again, this is John Pounders with Now You See TV. And you guys have a good night or good day or whatever it may be in your neck of the woods. Thank you. <laughs>